We was the dudes. We was the dudes in the streets. We was the dudes people was coming to. I touched so many kilos of cocaine, cooking, opened up the kilos to put in the pot, that my skin, my skin on my hand, all this peeled off, was just peeled off because of the purity. Drug dealers have a sense of freedom about themselves, even though the end of the line means prison or death. Why do I think gangsters had the most influence in the hood? Hmm, good question. Well, in my opinion, they're really the only ones in the hood. Most everybody else stays away, goes to work, come home, and stays in the house afraid to walk their own streets. So when a kid looks around, the only thing they can see are gangsters. And that's if the kid have the courage to walk the streets themselves. Well, the way that I came through it all, hmm, is like this here. I saw a need and said, hey, why not fill it? No particular reason, just because that's what I wanted to do. Freeway Ricky Ross was one of the more charismatic, colorful, and ultimately influential uh, drug dealers during the 1980s in Los Angeles. He started small, he got large, his reign uh, was very much connected to what was known as the crack epidemic. Yeah, I didn't ever know about Rick in the cocaine business as he was, I never really realized it till the police started coming. Yeah, the Freeway Boys was established around uh, the 1980s. I came along maybe around the end of 1983, beginning of 84. Yeah, a lot of gangsters, you know, real down to earth brothers, you know. They want to get down for the cause. And the cause was we were broke. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, let's go and make something happen. We did. The Freeway Boys consisted of, let me see, maybe 10 to 15 guys that grew up together right in the area, right next to the freeway. It was about 15 of us in the house and they had 50 police. It was three per one of us. And it was not planned. They had my picture, uh, uh, Grump's picture, and they had Rick's picture. Well, they all were my companions, you know. We, we stayed together, you know. A lot of we had houses in the same place or, or else we had a house where we all stayed. So they all were pretty much my companions. We pretty much did everything together, you know, chase girls, drove cars, you know, I lived at the house with him and moms and Sandy May. Um, I mean, we did everything together. We started playing football against each other, you know, growing up as kids, went to school together, 
And, you know, we just started hustling together. We out there in Compton, you know, one of our uh, areas we actually took over, you know, back in the 80s. We were syndicated through all L.A. County, all the way from Oxnard, all the way up to San Bernardino, as far as California. I mean, you get addicted to the power, the rush, just the overall being in the mix, you know, having the wheels turning, you know, because so many people don't know how to get their wheels to turn no other way. So dealing drugs is the perfect venue to bring all that to, to, to be. From poverty to, to millions. And I was sleeping up under the money. I was a money man. I mean, the safe was in my room. It was, it was like unlimited, brother. It was like a brother would go to sleep, wake up, and think about doing anything you wanted to do. It was wonderful. The Hoover Crips, um, the tie with the Freeway Boys, uh, I think it was a, 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 a pretty much a friendship ties that, you know, in the neighborhood, they seen what was going on. Uh, a lot of them, uh, the OGs, what they call, they knew Rick, you know, and knew of him. And the youngsters started knowing, hearing about the name Freeway Rick, and and they had um, a respect for Rick. And all through the jail system, they, you know, you hear a lot of them speaking of Freeway Rick. A couple of the Freeway Boys was Hoover Crips, so that automatically gave us a tie. And you know, we grew up with the Hoover Crips. We grew up in Hoover Hood, so that automatically tied us in together in in some form or fashion. And the Hoover Crips pretty much adopted us. It was a movement, and it was a lot of solidarity. And um, the 80s was like the stronghold of the real uh, G era, gangster era, as people follow it today. Rick was uniquely positioned in the city, and because he wasn't specifically allied with any one particular gang sect, uh, he was able to really work amongst a wide array of gangsters and local gang turf. And all of these various, you know, circumstances uh, allowed Rick to essentially create, a, you know, a, a sales empire that really dwarfed most of his competitors at that time. Jobs, uh, that wasn't too many jobs. But most people just, just was hustling, you know. It was on most people that I knew, it was like they was on the county, people just struggling. Most about that time um, when I got into selling crack, uh, I paid a role that was, uh, was honest and took care of good business. I become a driver for him. So I was the one who was delivering the drugs. When stuff needed to be enforced, that was my job. I was a lieutenant. And you know, people didn't want to pay up or you had to go make some collection. That was me. Me at 18, being the payroll man, being the payroll guy, paying everybody for working every week. I was exposed to all the money. I was exposed to three million, four million, six million dollars a day. They picked the role that they wanted themselves, and I let everybody play the role that they wanted to roll, that they wanted. Because it's easier when, when people pick their own role and they make up their mind that this is something that they want to do. I remember at a time where 
like I said, even the, the guns, that was the most memorable moments that I can remember because it was just about having protection. You know what I mean? It wasn't even about trying to worry about uh, the criminals. It was worrying about the police. The guns was really for the police officers and, and the dirty cops. Pretty much, these guys was uh, stealing money, taking money from dope dealers. Uh, they got caught up in a sting themselves. I mean, remember a couple of times they come and they would tell me they looking for Ricky. I had learned all of the cops' names because they would tell me what they're going to do to Ricky if they catch up with him. You know how I felt about that. I would always keep them in mind and tell them, they tell me they're going to whoop him. We're going to whoop him. Whenever we find him, we're going to whoop him. The LAPD was rocked by a huge corruption scandal involving policemen who were making profits from Rick Ross's drug trade. This was similar to the Serpico case in New York where illicit cops were uh, un unveiled and prosecuted. Like I said, I got busted with eight guns at one time. And they found a gun in every one of my rooms. You had to be prepared. I had a gun in the bathroom, the, the washroom, the living room, the kitchen, uh, the, all the bedrooms. So if anything went down, I was protected. He had incredible access to a remarkable array of weapons. And if you have, rec if you have access to a rocket launcher, chances are pretty good you have access to a lot of powerful weapons that are maybe a couple of grades below that, uh, but which would certainly command a lot of attention on the street. Back in those days, man, having brothers back you up, even when you was wrong. You know what I mean? That, that, that sounds crazy, but when you can have some guys to back you up when you're wrong, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that, that meant a lot, you know? Freeway Ricky Ross, he was able to put together what you would call a, a cartel, essentially, of, of neighborhood sub-dealers and people that worked under him that were able to transcend the normal neighborhood boundaries that exists because of, you know, gang turf. What did I want to be when I was a kid? Well, you know, as anybody, your dreams change as you come along, you know. Uh, at one time you may want to be a movie star, then you may want to be a firefighter, a police officer, or an airplane pilot. You know, so it changes as your wisdom grow. Uh, so I had a lot of things that I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, but the last one before I became a drug dealer was a tennis player. Lorenzo was a kid, maybe 18, 17 years old, when somebody first brought him to my attention and told me that he was one of the little homies and uh, that he wanted to get down. I was in college, as you in college right now, at 18. I was training to be a fireman. I was on my way to go play for the NFL. I was playing for Southwest College. And uh, my mother was on her deathbed. And my mother had a week to live. And I needed, I needed $30,000. I'm training to be a fireman. It's gonna take me another two years. I gotta take fire science. I gotta do this. I ain't gonna get no $30,000 in a week. So I'm just walking down the street. You know, I knew everybody in the neighborhood. I'm walking down the street and guess what? Freeway Rick saw me walking. He said, hey. What you doing? I said, man, I ain't doing nothing, dude. Stressing. He said, you want to work for me? And I'm like, shh, this is the man. This man got millions. Man, I can go cook up. Like, cool. I hooked up with him. He put me in a spot. I just had a big old thing of cocaine. At 18, I don't know what it was. All I did, I sold a, I sold a whole key in one week. I made $100,000 in one week. I was able to take care of my mother's hospital bill, buy my mother a home, take care of all my family. I built up trust where he can trust me. And there it is, it started from there.
I was a student athlete uh, at uh, LA High School, just graduating in 82 and had an opportunity to go to community college. Cornell was always, you know, a little sharper than most of the guys. You know, Cornell was, Cornell was very young, fast to the punch, didn't use drugs, didn't drink, didn't smoke. I mean, really clean cut kid. Was, was an athlete, you know. Uh, uh, I think he was still playing high school football when they first uh, told me about him. And I went and watched him play football. It was quick. I uh, had a determination that was out of this world. Academically, I screwed up in school. And so I went back to the neighborhood where I uh, grew up at. And uh, a good friend of mine uh, drove by and saw me standing on the corner. His name is Rick Ross. Uh, they call him Freeway. And he asked me a question about, man, what are you doing? You're supposed to be at school. I said, man, I screwed up. Can't play this year because I screwed up academically. And uh, he said, well, come on with me. Basically, seemed to surround himself with guys who knew him, you know, from you know for a long time to a point where they had trust. That they were all kind of in it, understanding that to work together was going to be good for everyone. Everywhere, cars everywhere. It's just a joyous occasion. I'm a low riding and and it's Chevys and you know a few Fords and you know most of them six four Chevys and you know some of them had some uh, um, trucks that they had fixed up. A lot of them just like to say living the living the life of Riley, living the lavish life. You know what I'm saying? Adam, all these doing what you can do. For a young guy in the 80s to start out with an eight ball, maybe pay $150 for it. By the end of the week, if he hustled 24, what they call 24-7, he could have he could be up on a key, which basically means 40000 dollars If he kept hustling two months, three months, he could be a millionaire. For real. The low riders became just amazing because now you had the money to put the kind of paint job and material. to not be ever ever be flashy but I always wanted to have a little style about myself and how I carried myself and uh, that just comes with uh, some things that you see in life you know you see things on TV that you like you know the girls or, or the big cars or, or the jewelry or, or having a mansion you know even like the movie Scarface you know movies like that did penetrate to, to make you think or believe that those things you could have if you just sold drugs. The drug dealers before me, they showed their wealth. They wore their wealth on their neck, their, their arms, and their fingers. And, uh, you know, I started a new era where you could just 
you know, wear a t-shirt and, and, and wear a cheap watch like this here and go with your hair uncombed and unshaved and, you know, wear some old tennis shoes would be ghetto rich, you know, you could walk around with $100,000 in your pocket and, you know, have people show for you around and keep, you know, two or three guys around you all the time and have houses everywhere and spend money freely. So I think I was the beginning of that era that, that, that started like that there because the guys before, they spent their money as fast as they made it. The 80s was a time when it just appeared that everybody was living a life carefree. Um, there was so much money being made from the distribution of that poison. There were young guys running around 15 and 16 years old, you know, millionaires driving brand new cars, um, owning houses. I knew guys that were living in apartments and driving Rolls Royces. You know, wearing the seventy, eighty thousand dollar Rolex watches, the baguette diamonds all around them, uh, fur mink coats in Los Angeles, where the weather never get up under forty, you know, fifty, sixty degrees, and these brothers running around in the minks, and you know, but it was all about bling, man. The freeway motor in, you know, that was a motel Rick had built from the ground up. You know, he didn't just go buy that from somebody. You know, he had that built and put together. You know, each room had his own unique quality. He had the Louis Vuitton room, the Gucci room, the Fila room. You know, every room had a different design in it. Then you had the Jacuzzi room. And you know, anybody in LA knew about the freeway motor and they had passed by it take pictures, you know, it was like a nice place to go. The freeway in here wanna tell the 74th and Fig, man, that was really a place that was cracking back in the 80s when Yayo hit the streets in LA and, you know, and throughout the freeway era, you know, when Rick, you know, set it out and um, the freeway era was cracking. That was one of the most prestigious uh, motels that was in the neighborhood that was considered slum, you know, but, when Rick took that thing over here and then it was like, that was one of the top of the line places, you know, with the satellites and, you know, it was real fly up in there and you have to be a person who has some, some hustle about yourself to be involved with them cats. But it was a, it wasn't a low budget hotel like the rest of the hotel, motel that was on Figueroa. I remember one time, we used to have call girls. We had a drawer, a dresser with six drawers. And, and in this drawer, we had $180,000 of $1 bills. And this was just our, our, our sex drawer filming. We had $100, 100, from $100 stacks, we had this one drawer, six drawers, and it had $180,000 in it. So whenever we wanted to get us some pussy, we would call up some call girls that cost maybe $150 a watch to get some pussy from them. I mean, it was like ordering a pizza. Whatever order you want, she come to the door. At that time, we had about 400 keys. We was rocking up, and we was taking it and putting it in large pots. And we put two keys in this large pot, and uh, we bought it until we come down to nothing but, but uh, like water. And uh, once once it get down 
to that stage, you take it and put it in a tub with ice in it to cool it off. And once it cool off, it's coming to something like a cake. And so once it gets in that cold, cold it swells and, and, and get hard like a rock. I touched so many kilos of cocaine. Cook it, open up the kilos and put it in a pot. That my skin, my skin on my head, and all this peeled off. It just peeled off because of the purity of the cocaine. I used to go over to my homeboy's house, cook it with about 300, 300 chickens. And wake up the next morning, the dude parrots were dead. Now you tell me that the parrots, that's what they use as animals. They use animals to, to test stuff. So imagine those parrots died. Imagine what was going on in our systems. Two times a week, three times a week. 200 keys, 300 keys. Talk about cooking. <laughs> that was the issue. smoking some fucking primos really. You feel me? I guess the first sign that, that, that we were having problems was when uh, when JJ started going through his little mental thing. It was time to be quiet, man. It was time to lay low. You know what I'm saying? That's what time it was. It was time to hide out. It was time to chill. You know, regardless of whatever you was going through at that time, it wasn't time. It wasn't about the time to go out and ring the noise and and, and bully and, and gangster people. But. Hey man, you know, everybody do, they, they work, they differently, you feel me? I just, I hood, I head out, you know what I'm saying? Because I knew it was going down. In Wall Street, the stocks went down, bro, in the ghetto. You know what I'm saying? All of those fancy living, being able to do this and do that, money was on hold. It was like the stocks just, psh, from one night they're being rich, to next night being broke. JJ is my first cousin also. I left uh, Texas and uh, came to California. And later on, he came out here during the 80s, and you know, and, and him and Rick was uh, you know, close. And uh, they worked it together, and I worked with them. JJ was something like that. He was so, sort of like a role model to me, you know what I'm saying? He was sort of like an older brother to me. So he kind of looked up to him after he moved to California, he got in the game and started, you know, doing things. So he kind of encouraged me, you know, along the way, the way to the route to go in the game. Jay had a lot of responsibility. He had a crew of people he had to govern. JJ, 
It was more like the, really, to be honest, it was, uh, it was about the business. He knew how to roll, you know what I'm saying? He knew how to go smash. He knew how to, wait before smashing was out. I mean, it was like, we had to, we, we, was the, we was the dudes. We were the dudes in the streets. We were the dudes people was coming to, you feel what I'm saying? So we had to have an attitude that's that, that don't give a fuck attitude, you know what I mean? Because we was dealing with so many killers and murderers and robbers and kidnappers and, and, and I mean, it was all the criminals. We weren't dealing with nice guys. The unity that we had, we stuck together. Everybody was for everybody, you know what I'm saying? We always watched one another back. We always stood together. I guess the first sign that, that, that we were having problems was when, uh, when JJ started going through his little mental thing. He had like a mental breakdown. He's always got to worry about the money. If it's straight, got to worry about the drugs, you know. And for a young man fresh out of Texas, you know, to be thrown in a position like that. The money and the, the power that Jay had in, in, in his hand, it got to be overwhelming, too overwhelming for him. During the time that he went out with a friend, he flipped all the way out. His mind just kind of like went. He's like socking car windows, breaking them out. And he wasn't JJ no more. He was kind of like, um, uh, you know, running wild, you know, just doing what JJ wanted to do. He rode around and he gangsted everybody. He gangsted all the customers. You feel what I'm saying? <laughs> he know what he did. <laughs> gangsted all the customers. He scared everybody. You know, he was breaking windshields with his bare hand. Feel me? He was walking to 56 Chevys with his knuckle, breaking the windshields, breaking everybody's windshields. You feel what I mean? With his bare knuckle. JJ lost his mind. AJ and, and Rick had some personal things that, you know, they talked about, they talked about with each other, you know, and, you know, maybe they got, you know, upset at each other or whatever, and some things came out and the same thing was said. Either him or either Eric started the, the, the dissension between the groups, I guess you, you would say, where they started telling the guys different things and, and they started the, the, the debates about what everybody else had and, and what I had and things of that nature. And so things started to, to get really rocky at that time. Rick didn't want to pay us, you know what I'm saying? He said he was going to pay us or whatever, but he never came off the money that he owed us. That's what started the animosity between us. We contributed a lot to the empire, you know what I'm saying? We worked a lot. We worked 24 hours a day, you know what I'm saying? Every day for a Four or five years, you know what I'm saying? We call ourselves taking JJ back to Texas so he can get his mind back. This is how serious the money, whole situation, you know, got dysfunctional with the whole situation with JJ. Um, we on the plane, we, I mean, we have to talk to JJ like, JJ, listen, brother, we're going to be cool on the plane, man. Be on a plane, you're gonna be cool, you ain't gonna do no outbursts, you ain't gonna trip, you're gonna be cool, right? Come on, man. So we had our homie Big Punkin, you feel what I'm saying? That we let Big Punkin, here, listen to Big Punkin, you feel me? So we let Big Punkin hang out with him and just like keep, keep JJ cool, homie, while we're on this plane. That can just let you know how JJ was, what JJ was going through, what he was doing, you feel me? It speaks for itself. June was a, a, a 
kid, you know, and he he, he was very young when he came in, into the the drug business, and um, so uh, really he didn't have a job, you know. He was just you know a person that looked out and did things for you know uh, Rick and you know for his homeboy. And matter of fact, June brought some his friends, you know, homeboys into the, to the uh, free boys and. Um, and uh, he was uh, kind of like a, a, a one to help them out, you know, and get them set up and, and get people to trust them. June had the kind of personality, you know, uh, you have to remember then he was in high school, but he had so many uncles, us, that you know, he would come by the house and he, he knew that it would be late, too late for him to tell me, figure out how, what he was going to tell me about why he wasn't in school. And he knew that I'd throw him the keys to one of my cars and I might have had seven, eight cars. So he had other uncles who had seven, eight cars. And he might drive a Cherokee to school today, a Mercedes to school tomorrow, a Ferrari to school the next day. I mean, you know. He was just, uh, 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 he was having himself a ball. As soon as he got in, Rick took him up under his wing, you know. That was Rick Little, that was Rick Little Road Dog. This call will be recorded and monitored. I have a collect call from an inmate. How much is your bed? June, you know, they moved to Louisiana. And, uh, with a crew that June had put together. And uh, right before they took off going to Louisiana, it was uh, somebody had got caught up in, in with the jail. And June was supposed to, uh, Rick had gave June some money to uh, get get him out of jail. And he supposed to have dropped the money off. June forgot and the money was in a car and somebody got in the car and took off and the car got impounded and the money was inside the car. The person that was trusting Rick to bail him out, you know, and, and, and it was kind of a big issue. So uh, uh, Rick would then, and then uh, told he wasn't going to trust June to do anything like that for him no more. So um, uh, things kind of like separated between June and Rick. June was just saying all day that he was tired. He was ready to go. This is what he telling me, you know, all day, I'm tired, so. I'm ready to go, man. So June had, you know, he told me that, uh, that uh, somebody had took his thousand dollars that they had gave him, you know, to do the Christmas shopping over the Johnson house. He had uh, a little kind of a strange look on his face, you know, that. Where we going? We left and uh, went back over to Johnson House and then we were supposed to left to go get something to eat. We went up to Wings and things on Weston and uh, they, they, they came back over to Johnson House and then they coming back up to the motel. Uh, shot that in the head. Uh, tried to shoot Steve. And then the car crashed and he shot himself in the head. Shot 
myself too. You know, it's hard for me to believe. I'm like, you know, I just saw this kid, you know, uh, hours ago, you know, and, and he had did this to his homies, you know, two, two guys that he loved. And I had saw no sign of him committing suicide. So. side of the street, the car was on the, on the opposite side of the street on the 73rd, and, uh, and right at the corner. And uh, we were standing there, and uh, one of the police recognized Rick, and uh, he came over there by the, by the motel, and plain clothesman, and he said, hey you, come here. So I was standing in front of Rick, so I walked up in front of him. I mean, I walked up to the police. And he still, he was like standing at me. He said, no, you. And, 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 and Rick walked up there right, right beside him. And uh, he had his gun out. And uh, we, we just standing there. He said, show me some ID. And uh, Rick showed him, Rick threw his pocket to show him. And uh, he gave him the, he, Rick just gave him the wallet. And when he talked, got the wallet, he looked at it. And when he looked at it, Rick, took off. Hey. And then the police with the go point the gun at him. I hit the gun and pushed it up and, and, and I got in front of him and he said, hey, 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 don't run, don't run. And he Rick jumped over the fence. And he said, no man, you ain't gonna shoot my cousin, you ain't gonna shoot my cousin. Man. You ain't going down like that. I stopped in Chicago, I call. I get the news like, June dead, Kelly dead. I'm like, what? And the first thing that ringed to my mind was, oh my God. He told me he was tired. He told me he was ready to go. And I'm like, wow. The organization was like ready to come to an end at that point. And I guess I said uh, suicide is about the most damaging thing I can see. significant headway in cutting the flow of narcotics and dangerous drugs into the country. Because we believe that drug abuse can be prevented through education and drug addiction alleviated by medical science, I am today proposing a massive legislative program aimed at stepping up the battle on these two fronts, in our neighborhoods and our schools.
about 15 of us in the house and they had 50 police. It was three per one of us. It was not planned. They had my picture, uh, uh, Grump's picture, and they had Rick's picture. That was it. came through, man, it was so smooth. Um, we were in there playing dominoes in the office, and the young man walked up to the window, but he came up to the screen first. You know, we had a screen, we had the window at the motel. The dude walked up to the screen door, he looked in the screen, he looked in, he said, oh, I made a mistake. Walked up to the window, I walked up to him, I said, man, what you doing, how you doing, brother? He said, yeah, man, uh, I need a room, man, I heard you, I got a cool jacuzzi room, you know what I'm saying? I said, man, the room was $85. He said, oh, yeah, let me check, man, he got like, well, he has some money, like, oh, man, I'm sure it's $85. Man. My whole entire family, when Ricky was in trouble, had to go through. They was they were there for me. It's all part of the game. You know, uh, it goes with the territory. Going to jail is, is you know, it's part of selling drugs. And anybody who fool themselves into believing that they're gonna sell drugs forever and not go to jail, you're tricking yourself. It was just self-destruction. It was, we was going back to the drawing board and people couldn't take the pressure of being back broke, not having no money. You want to talk about prison. You know, most of my time was fighting against the federal police and the fucking uh, BOP officers, man. You know what I mean? Keeping them pen, keeping them people off of me, bro. That was the most hardest time I ever did in my life, which was my first time. But man, they tried to get me for escape, murder. I had a fight with a prison guard. The proliferation of drugs in American society has been helped by ingenious businessmen who have gone into the drug trade, such as Frank Lucas, Pablo Escobar, and Rick Ross. These men have become heroes in their own neighborhoods by using some of their ill-gotten gains to help the population uh, avoid famine, foreclosure, etc and have become folk heroes. And this, of course, has propelled them into near political status in their respective countries. This game wasn't built to last. It was, it was built to end the way it did. Uh, I'm just grateful and thankful that I'm alive and that he's alive because the dope game, it kills everything you love. No matter how much money you think you're going to get out of it, how much jewelry, how, how many girls, how much power, it's still going to end up killing everything you love. There's no successful way of doing this. My advice is this. Can you do the time? I mean, could you go make millions of dollars and get busted and it's nothing you can do with that money? I made a lot of sacrifices. I did without a lot. I had to start all over again. I had to find out who I was and what I stood for. To summarize the rise and fall of Rick, Freeway Ricky Ross and the, and the Freeway Boys is basically to say that the story is a, a meteoric rise and a terrible fall. And in some ways, it's symbolic of exactly the same effects that one has 
when using the drug crack that they were selling. Just let the Lord do it by.